It's always a privilege to stand before the church and get to share what God has so graciously, um, so graciously has, has shared with me. And I pray this morning that as we dive in, uh, that the Lord's going to send His Holy Spirit and that our hearts will be illuminated to, um, to what He is asking us to know and some new things, maybe some old things, and certainly be glorified. So let's pray as we get started this morning. Father in heaven, we invite your spirit in with us, illuminate our hearts, share the joy that is set before us to be able to enjoy the depth and the knowledge and the riches of your word. Be glorified this morning in all things and change us as we seek to know you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so I like to ask a great question, and I think this is going to resonate pretty well with most of everyone in this room. Why do we spend so much money and time and effort to prepare for a wedding? That's a great question. That is a great, <laughs> that's a great question, isn't it? Like, okay, so I was thinking, you know, there's good reasons for this, right? It's the love that parents have for their daughter. You know, it's the parents wanting to honor this decision to make a lifelong commitment. And, and then there's the bad reasons, mm. right? Bride wants what she wants when she wants it <laughs> and wanted it yesterday. Cough, cough, Bridezilla, cough, cough. Okay. Or what about the parents then just trying to put on a bigger show than their neighbors did for their daughter, right? There's, so there's the right reasons to do these things and there's the wrong reasons to do these things. But as we look at this, what is the most extravagant way that you've ever heard of? I'm sorry? The Royals. The Royals. Didn't take long for us to go there, did it, right? And quite frankly, I, I wasn't alive in 1981. Okay? Uh, I, I know, right? I wasn't alive in 1981. But there was an event that happened in 1981. What, what was it? Charles and Diana. And this is St. Paul's Cathedral. 3,500 guests in attendance. The absolute who's who of every world, nation, such. I mean, my goodness, right? That was the invitation of a lifetime. Between the flowers, the music, the venues, the arrangements, the dress, the photography, do you have any idea of how much in today's dollars that wedding cost? $148 million. And if that doesn't make you go, oh, okay, the father of the bride goes, thank you, darling, for not asking for all of that, right? Okay, but at the same time, it's just, it's just blatantly overwhelming. And I don't, I don't think the world probably will ever see again a wedding that public or that extravagant than than what was what was done in 1981. But I do have a, I'd like to point out something though, um, and I'll do it in the form of a question: How much did God do to prepare for the first wedding? The first wedding. We go to scripture, right? Genesis 131. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God made the universe for the first wedding. And not just the universe, but the earth. And not just the earth, but the life on the earth. And then not just the life on the earth, the Lord planted a garden. Genesis 2, 8, and 9. And the Lord planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground, the Lord God made, up, made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, my gardening attempts in a fallen world are pretty pathetic. I'm not going to lie. But could you imagine? Like, take for a second and try to visualize in your head. What do you think the Garden of Eden would look like with the trees in the center as its masterpiece, as its centerpiece. Maybe something like this, okay? A little bit rustic, a little bit modern, a little bit of everything built in there. God is 
God didn't make the platypus after all, right? Mm. He's going to be extremely creative in how he did it. What about this other one, right? With winding paths, maybe there was some fountains, maybe there was other things in there. Art can't do justice to probably what it looked like. And we can try, but we'll probably fail. And so God plants this beautiful, wonderful garden, and he brings the man in and he plops him in it, and then what happens? Genesis 2, 18 to 34. And then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heaven and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord, Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he took, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Can you imagine that moment where God brings Eve to Adam and then orchestrates and ordains and blesses the first marriage? Did you see the look on Adam when he first sees Eve? He's just named all these different animals, and he's like, no, that, no, 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 God, what, what's going on here? And then he brings Eve, his Eve. And the mouth just kind of drops halfway open and he goes, whoa, man. Mm. Did you get the joke? Okay. Sorry. Right. That was off the cuff. That wasn't. <laughs> so just at the beginning of human history, God starts with an extravagant wedding. How appropriate is it that Jesus also starts his public ministry at a wedding? Remember, beginnings are important. And Jesus could have started his public ministry with something much more massive. He could have done a massive miracle or a sign from heaven, and, and certainly his baptism had this occur. I mean, the heavens were parted and the, a voice spoke from heaven and a, and a dove descended on Jesus, symbolizing the Holy Spirit. But in stark contrast, just as Jesus was predicted to ride into Jerusalem on a humble donkey rather than a kingly horse, he chooses to start his miraculous ministry at a country wedding. So our scripture for today will be in John chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 1 together. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And so the first question is, where, where's Cana? If you're not familiar with biblical geography, well, welcome, welcome to the last book of the Bible, the maps. Right? No, it's not the last book of the Bible. But um, having been there... I can tell you, you can actually, off your, there's, there's cliffs that are right about here and here. And you can actually, there's an overlook. And you can actually look and you see one end of the Sea of Galilee over here. And it just goes all the way across. And you see all the way over to the end of the Sea of Galilee, other with the mountains beyond. And it's, it's really quite something to behold. But the reason I point out Bethsaida right here to start is because that's where Peter, Philip, and Andrew were from. And so if they're called to be disciples of Jesus in the earlier scriptures that we've already gone over was in or around Bethsaida, then they have a bit of a hike because how far did they have to walk to get to Cana? And it's kind of hard to see here if you go back, Josh. Nope, I'm sorry. Right, no, sorry. it's the same, same here. You've got these. This is, this is 10 miles. So here to here is 10 miles. And way over here. Right off the map is Bethsaida here. So you're looking at about a 20-mile trek to go from Bethsaida to Cana. And that is not flat terrain, people, let me tell you. That is not flat terrain. It just, it just here, here, and then So um, I would, you, you would have been a little bit tired to, to walk all the way up from Bethsaida to Cana, to Cana over those 20 miles. Now, we're not told if Nathaniel, who was also called Bartholomew in the other Gospels, knew the couple getting married, but we do know from John 21, 2, that Cana was Nathaniel's hometown. 
So when Jesus said, hey, boys, there's a wedding in Cana. We're headed there. You know Nathaniel was like, hot dog, I'm going home. This is going to be great. The next part of the scripture there is that Jesus' mother was there. And immediately the question goes, where's Joseph? We're not told. But his absence is sort of striking. All we know, and it's implied, is that Joseph died somewhere between Jesus staying behind in Jerusalem at age 12, and then now when Jesus is 30 at the start of his ministry. We don't know the circumstances. We're just not told. So let's press on to verse 2. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. And you wonder if the connection with Mary, who was going to be at the wedding, actually had something to do with Jesus being invited. But, but here we go. At this point, we know that Jesus had at least five disciples with him. Uh, John, Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. And they were also invited to the wedding. And so what's the purpose of a wedding? It's a celebration, right? There's a ceremony, and then what? The reception. There is a party. There is a reception. It's a celebration of joining the two into one flesh. And what did this look like in Jewish culture of the first century? There would be a short ceremony, and then the bride and groom retired to the place that he had prepared, a wedding chamber. And the friend of the groom, the best man, stood at the door and guarded the door. Now, with the kids in the room, I'll just say, something happened, okay? And then you see this fulfillment of John 3, 29. And don't, don't miss this, because in many ways, John the Baptist was actually considered the friend of the bridegroom. And so if Jesus is the bridegroom, John is the best man. And so when he says this, he gives us a little context from scripture into what this part of the bridal ceremony was like. John three twenty nine. I don't think we have it. We don't have that one. Oh no. I'm sorry. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. And therefore this joy of mine is now complete. So when Jesus began his ministry, John said, Hey, this is, this is happening. My job as the best man to, to kind of prepare the way is, is done. But the friend of the bridegroom would then share the news that the consummation of the wedding had happened. And then, then the party would begin. That Jesus would bless a marriage with his presence gives perspective as to possibly why the Jews accused him later of being a glutton and a drunkard in Matthew eleven nineteen. 19. But we know that Jesus was neither of these. So what is Jesus doing here? He's blessing the start of a family. He's blessing a community celebration. Now, when I quote theologians, I'm, I'm hoping I'll, I'll, I'll try to quote either really, 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 really solid ones who are alive or dead ones. Because the dead ones can't change their positions later. So we're going to quote a couple bits of Spurgeon <laughs> this morning. Jesus, Spurgeon said, Jesus comes to a marriage and gives his blessing there that we may know that our family life is also under his care. And I would take it one step farther, and I would suggest that we should invite Jesus into everything we do. And that would allow us to then rest in knowing he's taking care of us for his glory and our ultimate good. So naturally, if it's all about God's glory and our ultimate good, then that's what Jesus is going to do right here in this wedding. He's going to glorify himself and do something amazingly good for these newlyweds. So let's pick up in verse 3, because for something to have to go really good, something has to go really, really wrong. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Does any wedding ever go perfectly? Mm -mm. No, I get the head shakes. No weddings ever, ever go perfectly. Our first dance song was supposed to be a song that I mixed. It was supposed to be this beautiful slow waltz, and then it mixed into this fun little shagging kind of thing, and we're going to do the twirls and everything else like that. And the guy who was playing the music off of my laptop started living on a prayer instead. <laughs> I, I kid you not. And everybody had to wait while I went... Do, 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 do. It was like, <laughs> and the guy 
was like, is this really his first dance song? And I'm like, no, it's not. It's not my first dance song. And poor Heather, I left her on the dance floor. Bless her. And, and had to run over, click the button. Hey, press play when I get back over there. And, and then God worked it out. So we, we all have a laugh, right? Um, I don't feel bad having to do this then. No. <laughs> And we didn't serve wine, but the chocolate fountain almost ran out. I mean, come on, right? It's the chocolate fountain. But that was another part. Everyone who is in this room who is married can tell hilarious stories of their own wedding or ones they've witnessed. And like our own imperfections, they add depth and perspective to the memories of our special day. I believe God designs our lives like that to realize our dependence upon him. However, for this couple... If the wine ran out, they're looking at a little bit more than just a memory that they can laugh about later. They are looking at a major cultural faux pas. Like literally there's nothing, not only is there nothing for them to drink, the parents of the bride, if the bride price was not quote good enough or to their expectations, or the wedding had some cat catastrophe to it, they can actually sue the parents of the groom. Or sorry, I think I got that backwards. No, it was actually, no, that's right. The, the bride, that's correct, I apologize. The parents of the bride could actually sue the parents of the groom for the wedding not going well or not going well enough. We aren't told the reason for the wine running out, but either the couple being married were poor and the parents were poor and they hoped to ration out the wine for a whole week and failed, or more people than expected came. And certainly, even then, there was actually a moment where, in fact, wine was considered a symbol of joy for in that culture. So if the, if the wine work ran out at the wedding, there was actually an implication by to the attendees that the wedding couple were not happy. And that, that's not good. Now, we don't know if this was a public or announcement or if there was something more private. Scripture does actually sort of imply that it was privately communicated um, the wine ran out. This is not good. But then we have to ask the question, why would Mary then come to Jesus? And no, notice, she didn't ask for anything. She didn't demand anything. She didn't plead with him about anything. Scripture tells us that she just informed Jesus. They have no wine. That's all we're told. Now, human psychology would say that Mary was motivating by informing, right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever done that? It's like, there is a hat on the laundry room floor that doesn't belong there. Right, boys? Okay. And granted, what does Ephesians 6, 1 say? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. But how silly does it sound for us to tell God what's going on in his creation? Mm -hmm. He already knows. But lest we become fatalistic, you can look at two things here. Mary's statement is a sort of prayer. She knows that her son is the Messiah, after all. And we must remember also, God loves to hear our prayers and communicate with his people. But Jesus' response is very interesting in verse 4. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My, ta my hour has not yet come. And at first blush, this is, this is, I mean, right, what? The culture has pitted man against woman and woman against man. And like the first thing you think of is some, you know, person going, woman? Is that, is that what Jesus is doing to his mother here? Absolutely not. If we miss the inflection, we miss the tender part of Jesus. A better word that could actually be interpreted maybe how we would use this in English with the right inflection would be lady. Almost like my lady. What does this have to do with me? And then why does Jesus not call Mary his mother? I propose something similar to when Mary Magdalene at the resurrection, just outside the tomb, she tried to cling to Jesus' feet. Do you remember that? And Jesus said, don't cling to me for I've not yet ascended to my father. What Jesus was telling Mary post-resurrection, that there was a different relationship that he now had with her. After resurrection versus 
pre-crucifixion. And so just like Mother Mary informed Jesus that there was no wine, Jesus is responding by informing his mother that his relationship with her had changed. But there was no disrespect in Jesus' response. Now, what does he mean when he says, my hour has not yet come? In other scripture, when Jesus says this, he's actually referring to his upcoming death. It's like my, the hour of my sacrifice has not yet come. But in this instance, he is referring to the start of his miraculous ministry. And it seems like Jesus is politely concluding his response to his mother with sort of a, no, not yet. But then as we see in the story, he does do something about it. Is he conflicting himself? Well, no. Even though at first glance it looks like he could be, we have to look at other cross-references and you'll see what Jesus is up to. John 5, 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Are you connecting the dots? After Mary just walks up and informs him and says, they have no wine. And Jesus says, my time has not yet come. There is a time and a moment where Jesus then went to the Father, communicated with the Father, and the Father revealed it's go time. Do it. But even before that, we have to read John chapter 2, verse 5. His mother said to the servants, so as soon as this conversation, and Jesus basically told her, no, not yet, she turns right around and goes, do whatever he tells you to do. What faith Mary had here. Remember, she knows that her son is the Messiah. She had no promise from Jesus that he was going to do anything about the problem. No miracle, nothing spectacular. But it's like she read between the lines of Jesus' response and trusted his judgment completely. Now, how difficult is that for us when we're praying? What responses can we get from God? Yes, no, not yet, silence. And how are we supposed to respond? Respond as Mary did, in faith. Do whatever he tells you to do. But did you know that this verse has actually been taken out of context by a major chunk of Christianity? To say that Mary still has authority over Jesus and can tell him what to do. Does anybody know what a Hail Mary is? Yes, I know, I know. Notre Dame football reference, right? Okay, stick with me. What type of school is Notre Dame? Catholic. Catholic. There's a prayer called a Hail Mary. It says, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of death. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Catholics believe that if you pray to the Mother of Mary, or sorry, Mary, the Mother of Jesus, that she has the power to intercede for us to Jesus and plead our case with him. Now, we must be very careful. We must never take scripture out of context. Because then that can be misapplied to create a precedent that's incorrect. And quite frankly, not only incorrect, it can become very dangerous. So I would like to point out two scriptures this morning that directly contradict this incorrect interpretation. 1 Timothy 2.5, which states, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Here's the kicker. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Once we have received the grace of salvation, we need no man, saint, priest, or angel to help us communicate with God the Father. Aside from Jesus himself 
because of the Holy Spirit residing within us. Get that, get, get that again. We have direct access to speak directly to Jesus. Actually, we speak directly to the Father in the name of Jesus because we've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Let me say that again because that, that's, that's huge. We speak directly to the Father in the name of Jesus because of the Holy Spirit that is residing within us. We have a direct link to God. Even the angels marvel at this gift that God has given us, both of the ability to believe and have not seen God in faith and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The angels marvel that God has given His Spirit to dwell in believers. Praise God that the veil is torn and we have direct access to the Father through Christ. Now, back to the story though, we know that if Jesus is going to do something, right, he's going to glorify himself, and by glorifying himself, he's then going to glorify the Father. So let's see how he does it, because this is where it gets fun. Verse 6 and 7. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Now, why stone? Why stone jars? You'd think clay would be a little bit easier, right? Probably lighter, less problematic. But in the law of Moses, clay pots could be defiled. Stone could not be defiled. So these were most likely limestone jars of various sizes that had been carved out of solid rock. Now, it's interesting, just like the mikvahs that we talked about where people would ritually cleanse themselves, guess what those mikvahs were made from? Limestone. So that the water could technically not be made unclean. And these were then used for pouring out water over the head or the hands and becoming ritually clean. And these large jars would have been a part of the wedding ceremony, and they would have also been for the guests to wash before eating. And if you stop and think about the amount here, you've got 20 to 30 gallons times six. You've got 120 to 180 gallons of water here. Have you ever hauled anything in a five gallon bucket? No. <laughs> I mean, I barely lift it myself. Water in its own way weighs 8.34 pounds a gallon. If you do a little bit of math here, people, you're talking about 1,000 to 1,500 pounds of water. How long would this have taken? How many trips to the well would this have taken? How many servants were there to do this? There is no small task that just occurred. The scripture implies that this all happened, though, behind the scenes. It's kind of sneaky. It's kind of exciting. But you wonder if there were people filing in and out with lots and lots of water, you'd wonder people maybe would have started asking questions. But the most important part of all of this, and they filled them up to the brim. The servants obeyed. They obeyed without question, and they fully obeyed. Got another Spurgeon quote for you. When you are bidden to believe in Jesus, believe in him up to the brim. When you're told to love him, love him up to the brim. And when you're commanded to serve him, serve him up to the brim. Verse 8. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, they did not know where it came from, though the serpents who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to them, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. The servants obeyed, and God did the miracle. Does that sound familiar? That has direct application to the church. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 7, Paul says, I planted an Apollos water, but who gives the growth? God. God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. I don't think it was coincidence that one of Oswald Chambers' devotions this week says, I, am, I indeed am at the end. 
and I can do nothing more. But he begins there. He does the things that no one else can ever do. What an encouragement to us that when we obey the Lord and reach the end of our wits, our strength, and our resources, God is ready to do what only he can do for our good and for his glory. Reminds me of Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But this still leaves the question, how did Jesus do it? When did Jesus do it? And the answer is, we're not told. But the implication here is that he just willed it. And it happened. Now those with any knowledge of wine know that great care must be taken during the entire process from planting, nurturing, harvesting, crushing, fermenting, processing, aging, bottling. I mean, all of that would have had to have happened probably over the course of years to create this type of wine that the master of the feast is describing here. Just as later we'll see when Jesus heals the servant of the Roman centurion from afar, it's easy to miss the miracle in the miracle. We could just stop and read the scripture and say, God did it. And then when we realize how something so complicated for us is just so simple for God, the more we ponder about that, the more we marvel. It points back to John 1 verse 3. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And as it says in the scripture, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Speculation runs wild here. Did you see the look on the face of the master of the feast as he tastes the wine and goes, you guys got this backwards. Or could you see the quiet grin on the face of the servants as they knew where this wine had come from and they knew that just moments before it had been water? Can you see the worry on the bridegroom's face melt into incredulity about where this new wine came from and then release relief as he realizes he's been saved from public embarrassment. But what does the master of the feast say about it? He says, you've saved the good wine until last versus the poor wine. And way, way too much ink has been spilled on page after page after page about what was meant by good wine versus poor wine. Now, quite frankly, I mean, it's a joke that the master of the feast was telling the group. He was joking with him, saying, you know, everybody waits till they've drunk freely. It was sort of a crass joke, quite frankly, if you actually look way back into the, the ancient language. But let's not overlook it. Was it the strength of the wine or was it the quality of the wine? Is Jesus condoning drinking alcohol? But these are actually the wrong questions to ask. Because scripture doesn't reveal the answers. The proper question to ask here instead is how does this glorify Jesus and also glorify the Father? Here's how it happens. God provides provision for this moment of a wedding reception gone wrong with what scripture simply calls good wine. And that quietly glorifies and points to Christ as the real bridegroom. Of all the vats, if all the vats were made into wine, there's a good chance that that party was not able to consume the rest of that. Any leftover wine could have actually been sold and provided the newlywed couple with the gift of a financial start. So God doesn't just look to provide in the moment. He's looking to provide for us in the future. Let's finish with verse 11. And I think we'll also read verse 12. Sorry. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Canaan in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Believed in him. An interesting point here is that all this happened on the third day, according to John 2, verse 1. On the third day. Coincidence? Never. <laughs> and his disciples believed in him. But far from implying that before this, his disciples didn't believe in him, we already know that Andrew, Philip, and Nathaniel, who's also known as Bartholomew, had made professions that Jesus is the Messiah, publicly, to Jesus. 
The disciples instead are deepening their belief in Jesus. And their belief will continue to mature and grow, not only throughout the next three years, but for the rest of their lives. And there's something important, lest we miss verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Jesus' ministry is now officially off and running. Can you feel the excitement in the disciples? They've just witnessed Jesus do an amazing thing. And it's easy to think when you read the Gospels that things actually happen in rapid-fire succession because we can sit down and read two or three chapters of Scripture that might cover six months, 12 months. Go read a genealogy, you can cover a couple hundred thousand years. But Jesus is following the instructions of his Father, and he's pacing himself for the work ahead. Not everything has to always be done in rapid-fire succession. As believers... God's not going to work us to the bone. He's going to work us on his time, and there's going to be times of intensity, but there's going to be times of rest. And you'll see that. Jesus is always looking for that opportunity to recharge, make sure he's continuously in communication with the Father about what's the next step. Lord, what's your will? Lord, what do you want me to do next? That's our takeaway from there. Jesus is gathering a following to support his ministry. And it's natural that his disciples would follow him, but his mother and family are also there at the start. And just like the disciples having to have their belief and understanding and knowledge of Jesus grow, watch what happens to his family. Watch what happens, the small snippets of scripture we see ahead where Jesus' brothers, and even implied that his mother, they have moments of weakness in the future too. They're going to face difficulty but ultimately be deepened by all the trials. So as we look to conclude our time together today, I want to attempt to answer two questions. One, what is the significance of the transformation of water to wine? Why, why those two symbols? Why those two things? And how does the idea of marriage continue in the ministry of Jesus? So first, let's discuss the water and wine. Water throughout Scripture is a symbol for life. Wine on the other hand, is a symbol for blood. Do you see where this is going? Our concept of life must be changed into Jesus' concept of life. And that's a miracle. That's a miracle of salvation. And just like what Stephen said last week when he pointed out what Jesus asked his disciples, what are you seeking? And I found myself trying to answer that question while I was driving to work saying, Lord, I, I, want, I, want what, I want life as you meant it to be. I want life as God meant it to be. And that's why Ecclesiastes says that God has placed eternity in men's hearts. There is a constant nagging in every human soul that says the way things are, are not the way things were meant to be. The way things are is living in the world of evil, facing temptations from all sides to sin. And facing the consequences of that sin, death, and ultimate separation from God. And so, how do we get back to the way things were meant to be? Well, what does that even look like? I mean, we saw the pictures of Eden, right? It's almost like we want to go back to Eden. Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the evening and fellowship together. What sweeter life could we ask for than to just simply be with the God who made us? And so here's where we begin to see God continue the symbolism of marriage in Jesus' ministry. Because it ends with, it started with a marriage in the garden. It started with a country wedding for Jesus' earthly ministry. And it's going to end with the marriage supper of the Lamb. The only way for humanity to be able to stand before God in fellowship would be to have their sins covered. God himself made the statute that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so there had to be a perfect covering for bl of blood that would not only shield God from our unrighteousness, but actually purify us from unrighteousness and give us the gift of clean hands and a pure heart. And so now we come to the final wedding plans. So imagine God writing out the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb 
at the cost of the blood of his only begotten son. The invitation reads as follows. To all humanity, you are hereby invited to come and partake of a wedding banquet at the end of time. In heaven, celebrating the marriage of the church to the bridegroom and redeemer, Jesus Christ. The dress code is to be clothed in perfect righteousness at a cost that is impossible for you to pay. For my glory, I have made provision to give you these clothes of perfect righteousness through my son, Jesus. He came to earth as a human and lived a perfect life by facing every possible temptation to sin and overcoming them all. He subjected his will to mine by choosing to die on your behalf on a cruel Roman cross so that his perfect blood might be available to anyone who would accept it, paying in full the penalty of your sin. Because sin was not found in him, death could not hold him. And he was resurrected back to life on the third day after his execution and now lives eternally in heaven at my right hand. Because he lives, if you repent of your sin, believe that my words about Jesus are true and accept the free gift of Jesus' blood as a payment for your sins, you too shall live eternally. Physical death will no longer have its sting, and your spirit will proceed into my presence when your life on earth is over, or at the last day. To RSVP, you must communicate to me by sincere prayer of repentance and your belief in Jesus as Savior by the end of your life, or by the end, or, or when Jesus comes back for his own. God says, I will personally apply the blood of Christ to your sins. Wash them clean and clothe you with Christ's righteousness. And the Holy Spirit, as we talked about earlier, will come and dwell within you as the seal of your confirmed invitation. So to this local body of believers this morning, the invitation is clear. It is wonderful. And it is freely given at this promised wedding banquet, we are told in scripture that sin will be no more, pain will be no more, all tears and sorrows will cease, and there will be never-ending wonder and joy as an infinite God continues to reveal himself to us forever. He'll always be showing us another new sign of how amazing he is. The final state in the presence of God will be life as it was meant to be. And maybe you know this old hymn, maybe you'll sing it with me. You ready? What a day that will be when my Jesus I will see when I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land. What a day, glorious day, that will be. Amen. Let's respond to the Lord. The word of the Lord spoken today in prayer. We'll worship in song, and during this song, we'll prepare our hearts for communion.